This tutorial was brought to you thanks to the supporters on the screen. Check out tapjiles.com to find more Dreams resources, donate to support my work, or engage my services to get private instruction or help on a project one on one. So the other day I made this uh, 2D sprite of a 3D object demo um, and I can move around the camera with the right stick and you can see the background moving so the actual camera is moving and based on the angle that I'm looking at this object at it's showing me a slightly different view so like now I'm looking at the right side and now I'm looking at the front side and so on and I can stay keep this still so if I put the kind of moon in the background and then use the left stick I can rotate the card itself separately but it's still based on what angle the viewer is seeing this object at so the idea of this is for like 2d uh, 2d 3d games like uh, the old doom and quake and whatnot where they would have like still flat 2d images and animate them and whatever but if you looked at uh, the same object from the side it would look different with like a different frame of the um, animation um, so you can do that in dreams based on just the, the view you're looking at and if I actually turn the turn the camera off so I'm moving it around freely but it's still um, using it based on the camera's position even though there is no camera object, it's just like the view the player has. So this can be used in any kind of game, really. But yeah, let's have a look at how to make that kind of thing over in a new scene. First, let's make a painting. So this just uses paintings, but the principle can apply to if you um, made these images using sculpts or um, or text gadgets or anything you like. Uh, you You can just kind of adapt it fairly easily. Let's turn on surface snap and look down and that way I can use this to kind of lay it out. I'll make it a cylinder because that looks a lot like just straight lines if you're just looking at it 2D. So we'll kind of cheat and make it a cylinder. So that's one side of the cylinder and you can see the, the face on that side and then um, with with paintings you actually have this frame by frame stuff so you can go next to get to the next frame and then draw the next frame and I'm gonna say the the head is moving around to the right when it's looking to the side it will look kind of across like that so I'll have the eyes at the front and then the mouth like that and then on the back it will just be the kind of cylinder shape I can use L1 and right to go between different frames. So if I go to one of the frames and copy a stroke, I can use L1 and right and left to go between the different frames. And even to a new one, if I go right on more, and now I can just like copy these strokes and have the same shape on different frames. Like that. And then I can turn that off and then so this is from the back and now I'll do one from the side again so I'll need another frame of these plus the uh, face starting to be visible on the other side so I'll do that cool so now if we exit and we play time it's going to play through those frames um, of just that painting and if you go to the frame by frame settings, you can set how fast it goes through those frames and make it faster or slower. Or you can just set this to different values. So if I put that to zero speed, I can now just set it to different values. And that's what we're going to be using. We're just going to set this frame to different things so that we can see different sides of it. So if I, uh, if I just move this up now and rotate it with L2 and we'll want some logic so let's have a chip and group it up so first uh, for this kind of effect you want the whole thing to face the uh, the actual player's view 
So normally the player's view will just be moving around on a plane as opposed to looking down at things and stuff. So if you wanted to look down on things, then you might want to have an extra view from the top or something like that. But again, these these ideas can be adapted for whatever situation you need it for. So if we grab a look at rotator, then in the inputs and outputs, we can set the affected objects to be that object, that group. And we want that to be the front, so let's point that like that. Now normally you give it a tag name, so normally you'd have a tag and give it a name and then use the same name with up and down on the d-pad or you can press x to type in there and now it will rotate to aim at that tag and if we have it with high damping and strength and we can type in a load of numbers in here with L1 and square on here and type in a load of numbers and then that will max out that value. So now it'll kind of instantly snap to it. But in this case, we've only got frames for like round uh, a plane. So I'm just going to ignore the fact that it's looking higher because it will start looking weird. So in the strength and distance tab of the look at rotator, we can turn off the strength in Y. And now it will just use X and Z, which is kind of a crossways and down into the screen. So if this was lower, then it would only follow it to a smaller amount sort of thing. So if you have it at zero, it won't follow it at all, but it will still follow it, the tag looking around like this. So if this was like the camera position, it would always look at the camera. So we'll always see the proper kind of sprite um, as we want it. So now we want to actually get the camera position and kind of feed it to this look at rotator. So we can get that from the global settings gadget. It has an output here for camera transform. And the transform means it's not just the position, but it's the position and the rotation or like mm. rotation like that. Um, and also the scale, which won't actually change with the camera for the this is kind of the player's view as opposed to the camera gadget that they're using or something it's the player's current view so then we can wire that straight into an input on the look at rotator which is called target position so now we we'll use the camera's the the player's view as the target position for this look at rotator so now we play time and we can just move around as normal there's no tag happening because we've got something wired into the target position, it's just ignoring the tag entirely. So we can just delete that now. And it's still following our view perfectly. So if we think about how this would work, trying to figure out if we're looking at it from the front or looking at it from the side, how should that work? Well, we want to know the rotation of this object, the rotation that it is when it's just looking forwards sort of thing. So if we imagine the forward facing direction as being this arrow, that's the forward facing direction. If we're looking from the side, then this arrow is, isn't pointing at the camera anymore. So we want to see a different view. And then it's looking away from the camera, so we want to see a different view. And now it's looking on this side of the camera, so we want a different view. So we need to know the kind of straight on direction of this object. So let's find that first. So instead of affecting the whole object, the whole group, uh, we'll remove that and scope in, and then we'll have this look at rotator only affect the painting. So now if we scope out and play time, the painting is still rotating to face the camera, but you can see the, the chip is not moving at all. And that's what we want. We want that chip to be represent kind of the forward facing direction for this sprite. So if we get a tag, a tag has a scene space transform, just like the camera has a transform. So if we put that into a splitter, we can actually see it's got lots of different colors going through it instead of a single uh, color like this, which is just one value. It has lots of colors, so there's lots of values coming through this kind of fat wire. So to find out the individual values from that, we can put it into a splitter gadget. 
and we can see that we have a position, an orientation, and a scale for this tag. So if we grab that tag, we can actually see it has a rotation to it. So if we can rotate it like that, now that orientation output will say something different. So let's um, find out what it says. Uh, and if we get another splitter, put that orientation in, we can see the orientation is multiple values as well. It's the yaw, the pitch, and the roll. The yaw is rotating around like this, kind of around the Y axis. The pitch is rotating around the X axis like that. And the roll is rotating around the Z axis like that, or the direction that it's kind of facing. So we can actually get those different values for this tag, uh, depending on like where it is and how it's been rotated. So if we grab that, we can see those uh, directions. But if we press triangle on it, it forgets it having a separate place and it will just be wherever this chip is. So now let's display the yaw because we want to know um, if we're looking at it from around this kind of rotation. So we'll use that uh, to continue. So we're putting it into a number displayer and we play time. So it's got zero on it. And if we rotate it around that kind of Y axis, we can see that it's giving us different values up to minus 180 and plus 180. And it kind of flips at some point around the back there. So now we have kind of a rotation of this object and we could have have this actually rotate and animate. And this might be like a enemy AI and it's moving around and stuff. And that's all totally fine because this this tag still represents its forward facing direction. So if the character decided to look in this direction, this will be giving us a different number pointing in that direction. So that's totally fine. Now we want to know, we want to compare how this is rotated to how the camera is rotated. Because if we're, if the camera is rotating this way, then we should be looking at the side of this object. So let's copy that stuff into an object that follows the camera or follows the player's view. So if you look in gameplay gear and then cam head slash camera tracker, that's what this does. It actually follows the view of the player. So for example, if I just put some random stuff in there and then go into play mode, then as I move around, it's just stuck to the player's view. And that's what we want for this tag. So we'll, we'll just kind of copy that into here. But so that we're, we're sure it's lined up perfectly. Yeah, I'm actually going to use the head position. So instead of having a tag in here to get the position, I can use this head position. And that actually gives us a full transform just like normal. So if I, uh, if I just, uh, for testing, I'll just copy this stuff down here and remove that and wire the head position in there. And you can see it's a transform with a position orientation and scale, just like before. And I can put this over here. So on the left, we have the, uh, the yaw rotation of the object. And on the right, we have the yaw rotation of the camera view. So as I rotate the camera view, it's giving us those different values and this isn't changing at all. So if we compared these two, if, so if this one is at zero with this, um, this, this arrow and we're around 90, then it means that we're looking at, or minus 90, then we're looking at it from this side and then we can tell it to show us a different view. That's the basic idea. So instead of having to wire this into all of the objects that we have, we're going to actually transmit this, uh, the, the Y, the your rotation. So within this, uh, this group, this is essentially just a group. I'm going to add a microchip and let's move that stuff over into the microchip. And then I'll send it out using a wireless receiver. So the wireless receiver can speak to transmitters. So the transmitter will be in our object. So we just want it to be in the scene. So instead of it having to be in a certain zone, we can send, send this data to anywhere in the scene. 
and then we want a name. So we'll give this transmitter a name that kind of uh, makes a radio channel that these can talk over. So this is the, the view your and then use up and down on the d-pad again to get the the uh, the that exact name and now we can send the your through that receiver and it will come out the other side so if we make a new number displayer and put it over here you can see that it's it's doing exactly the same thing it's like they're connected with the wire but it's using a special gadget so that you can just make a copy of this object a lot of times and they'll all receive it just as normal. So next we want to subtract one from the other so we can kind of find the difference because if you imagine this object was rotated like this it will be giving us a different number 49 but then we want to know we still want to know if we're minus 90 compared to wherever it's meant to be uh, looking so we want to find the difference subtract one from the other. So we'll just take this and we use a calculator. And wire one into B and one into A and just subtract the two. And we'll output that. So now we want to just display the difference between the camera rotation and this object's rotation. And then we can kind of see how that works. So as I uh, look straight on it's more it's quite close to zero and then as i rotate round to one side then it's going up and then up to 180 and then minus 90 roughly and then back to zero again so then using that we want to tell this to use a different frame depending on what value it is so for a simple example uh, this won't be how i actually do it in the end but to give the basic uh, idea if we find out if it's uh, if it's less than 100 and it's more than 60 then so we'll make sure it's an and so that's within like some range then we can use a keyframe and just set it to be a different frame like that so now at some point at some range of, of uh, values it's showing us a different side so that's exactly what we want but we we need to do that for every single side and if we wanted to have more than four frames so that it's a more subtle visual for it like with the card i showed then we'd have to have lots and lots of calculators to find all the ranges that we want. So we're actually going to do it a slightly different way. First, we're going to simplify this. So instead of it being minus 180 to plus 180, it's going to be from zero to 100. So to do that, we can use a signal manipulator. And I'll just put the result of that out into this, uh, this number display. And then we'll go into custom remapper mode. So here we can set the input range, which is minus 180 to plus 180. And you, you can't use L1 and square on this right now, but you can use up and down on the D-pad to get smaller increments instead of having to drag it. And up to plus 180. So minus 180 to plus 180, and that will give us a percentage between 0 and 1. So if we test that out. So it's just turned it into a single range between 0 and 1, like that. The cool thing about having a percentage now is that we can actually use a timeline to make these ranges of values. So it, for example, I can send in a percentage just using a value slider. I can go from 0 to 1. And I can wire that into the bottom of the playhead. And now as I change this, it will go to that point in the timeline. So I can say if it was between 0 and 0 0.3, I can just put a gadget there, a keyframe or whatever, and it would show the correct thing or do the right, activate the right uh, logic and so on. So if we just wire the 
the percentage signal that we made into the timeline. Now we can do stuff in here and use keyframes to affect this display of the uh, the sprite. So if I use a keyframe again, so we want a keyframe for, oh, let's just leave that empty for now. And I'll click on X on the time so that it now has these columns. And we'll want four of these like that. And then we don't need any more, so we can just do that. And when it's actually at 100%, it will be right at the end. But now you can see this stops, stops being lit up. So if we drag the end off, off of the end of the timeline, then when the playhead is at the end, it's still powering this one keyframe. So that will still work. So now let's use L1 and X on the keyframe and set these different values. And I'll go uh, and edit this one and press up so it kind of increments. I can actually use L1 and left or right while recording into a keyframe to go into the next ones on that row. So I'll set this to three and I'll set this one to four. So now let's see what we got. It might, might be not quite what we wanted. So it looks like it's not going around the right way. Oh, maybe it is. But they're at, diff at the, wrong, the wrong points. So they kind of... Yeah, we want the... We want the kind of range around here to be that front one, but it's kind of around the back. So if we just adjust that, you can see the timeline working actually. If we go into test mode with this timeline pinned to the screen, then we, you can see it's rotating and as we rotate, it's moving through the timeline. So we want it so that around from maybe that slot there, to that slot there should be the front. So which one's the front? That's that one. So let's just move it down here. And I think the rest were in the right order. So let's just move all these round. Like so. And we'll copy this one to the start. So now uh, from this range to this range, because it kind of flips around to the minus 180 again, then it will still show the back. And then it will show the side, and then the front, and then the side, and then the back. If we check what numbers these are, though, we can do it in a slightly easier way. So let's go through them. So there's one and then four is here. So uh, it goes one and then two and then three. So we can actually skip skip this one there. And depending on how you happen to lay out the numbers for this, you might be able to just have a keyframe at the start and a keyframe at the end and just blend through them. So with this card, for example, this has a lot more frames Go in here. Yes, yeah, so there's 16 unique frames, but then it's kind of being set by this keyframe. But it happens to be that I could start at 16 and go to 1, I guess. So I could just have one blend for the whole thing. So it's a little cheaper on Thermo, but it doesn't really make too much difference. But here we can just blend through that one and turn off smoothing like that. And hopefully that should work. So it's kind of changing too quickly because you want to set this like that, I believe. Yes, that's working. So now we have this face that's looking at you and depending on what side we're looking at it from, it's showing us the, the correct side. And if we added a ro oh, added a rotator to this whole object so that it just rotates by itself and again affect the group like that oh we want it to rotate around the yaw so it's like that so it'll rotate around that circle so now 
we're not moving and it's still the painting is still looking at us but you can see what the facing is doing is actually rotating with the microchip there so now it can do whatever it likes it can animate and it can run around the scene and look in different directions and it will still work and we can kind of still move around it however we want and it will still kind of keep up with us so if we kind of try and keep up with that arrow it will still look at us but if we let it get ahead of us then it will start looking to the right thanks for watching i hope you learned something new go to patreon.com slash tapgiles to get five hours of tutorials early for three dollars here's a preview of what you can learn if you choose to become a supporter 